Welcome back, everybody, live from the Anaheim Convention Center here in Southern California. It's time for our first exhibition match here at the Hearthstone World Championships 2015, and I can't wait to see how this show match unfolds between two poker legends. We have one Dan Negrano as well as Elky Poker, and I am excited to be casting this alongside with Brian Kibler as well as Life Coach, who's a special guest. Life Coach, how are you doing? Yeah, good, good, awesome. I'm enjoying BlizzCon. It's simply like an amazing... Uh, experience to be here and like so many people and I really enjoy it. Yeah, that's right. Life Coach, you came here as a top 16 competitor. Stopping in the final 12 is a very good accomplishment, but you must be also really happy to see your teammate Tice also perform well getting to semifinals. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, like, um, Tice going to the semifinals is a, uh, yeah, really, really great success and for us and also for our team. I mean, we have been working together basically the whole year, last year and, um, yeah, I mean, we both met each other when, like, Hassan was quite new, also new for us, and uh, it's, a, it's a really big coincidence and a really big um, fortune that, like, uh, now it, everything developed, how it uh, developed and uh, went well. And also with Oskar, I mean, uh, it's basically also the same with him. Like, I mean, we've been friends, like, close friends since a year, and it's the same, yeah. So, we're really happy. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's going to be really cool to see not only how the rest of the quarterfinals will pan out, but a special exhibition that we have prepared with these two players. Rachel is down on the stage to introduce us to our two competitors. Thanks, Dan. I won't waste any time. Here are these guys. They're ready to go. I'm going to introduce our first contestant. He's a former StarCraft player. He played in Brood War. He played Warcraft 3 profes uh, professionally. His name is none other than Bertrand Elke Grosbler. And our second competitor, a winner of six World Series of Poker bracelets and two World Poker Tour Championship titles, it's Daniel Negreanu. All right, come on down. Join me here in the center of the stage. Now, guys, I have a couple questions for you. I know you're ready to kick this match off. I know the competition is fierce, but I want to know, how did you prepare for this tournament, Elki? Uh, I prepared quite a lot. I mean, I've been playing a lot of Hearthstone, and I kind of want to thank also, like, uh, Neria and Monk, and that's admirable, and Sho, they both practice, they all practice with me and helped me a lot, so I'm pretty confident. You got some tips from the pros backstage, did you? Uh, uh, yeah, kind of. But I, I didn't practice as much with those decks I'm playing today, but I played the game a lot, and I watch all the World, uh, World Championship games as well. So I think it's got a good insight to the game. Yeah, there's a lot to learn from our World Championship games. And Daniel, I know you've learned a lot as well. You recently completed a, a huge Hearthstone milestone, if I'm not mistaken. Golden Mage right here, that's what's up. Hey! Yeah, unlike this guy, though, I'm going to play without the coaching and without being told what to do. I'm going old school. I'm gonna bring it. I'm gonna bring it to you with what I got. <laughs> well, you're bringing it to us old school. I want to know how much of your poker background is is helpful when you come and play Hearthstone. Well, for those of you who don't play poker, it, you know it's a strategy-based game, much like Hearthstone. So the skills translate. It's about well, what's he gonna do if I do this, and then what you know what happens after that. There's not really bluffing in Hearthstone, but it's still really, really fun, and I'm totally addicted to this game. Now. We have poker backgrounds for both of you, but Elki, you are a professional Warcraft 3 player, a professional Brood War, a professional Brood War player as well. How does that help you on the Hearthstone stage? I mean, for Hearthstone, I think, uh, like, you know, every, every time, like, you play something at a very high level, the competition and, like, the, the pressure and uh, the mind games, they're kind of the same in every game, so I think that's what helps the most, for sure. And uh, is there anything special on the line here? Did you guys make any uh, side bets, as it were? So, so here's what I'm thinking. When you lose the next poker tournament we play, you have to wear a sludge belcher costume. I lose? So you mean like in five years from now or something? <laughs> lose this match. You wear a sludge belcher costume. And if I lose, you pick my costume. What do you want me to wear? All right, so if you lose, you're going to be the Anoyotron. I win the sun, too. <laughs> Can you do the Anoyotron sound? Look, hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, hello. De -de -de -de. You guys are too much, and I think you guys are both ready for your match, if I'm not mistaken. All right, let's shake hands. Good sportsmanship, and you guys get to head into the booth. I'm going to hand it away to our casters at the desk. 
Thank you very much, Rachel. It seems like there's more on the line than just Pride, Kibler. These guys are betting their honor and a little bit of their public dignity <laughs> for their next tournament appearance. This yeah. is pretty fun. I'm, I'm, I'm really not, enjoying it. I'm not really sure which I would rather see, you know, Elkie as a sludge belcher or Daniel Negreanu as an Anoyotron. Both of those seem like pretty funny, uh, pretty funny things to witness. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be actually funny if both of them lost, so they have to that, simultaneously dress up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like I'm watching Freeze Mage. I'm rooting for both players to lose. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, at, least, at least for Kibler's sense. Uh, we'll take a look at the classes right here. It looks like Daniel has chosen to play the Druid, the Hunter, and a Mage, a class that uh, Negrano is definitely very favored in the past. And Elki is bringing Warlock, Shaman, and Mage. That's a very interesting lineup. What do you think, Life Coach? Hmm, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't exactly, like, of course, know what these decks are. Like, for example, the Warlock, like, is it Zoo or Handlock? But I guess nowadays in this current environment, like in the pro environment, it should be probably Zoo. But I don't know those guys, so... <laughs> sure, sure. But, um, and I guess the, the mage looks like a giant Echo Mage, I guess. It could be. <laughs> yeah. that, that's something that uh, LQ was flirting with the idea, telling us that he likes those kinds of decks. And if you guys like what you're seeing, whether you're liking the matches or you want to let us know your predictions, make sure to join in the conversation. Hashtag HWC2015 and let us know who you're rooting for. Is it Daniel Negreanu, the player that's won so many bracelets and titles over his career? Or maybe LQ, who's a little bit closer to the Blizzard franchise, uh, being a former Brood War player. You know, he would travel to Korea and compete against some of the best in the world. And now he's here competing uh, once again in Hearthstone. It's really awesome to see him come home. Yeah, I actually first heard uh, of Elki when he really made the transition from uh, playing a competitive StarCraft in Korea mm -hmm. to playing poker professionally. Yeah. And he said that the sort of rigid trading environment, the really intense practice sessions in StarCraft translated very well to studying intently to, to you know, improve his poker game. And how does that work for, uh, for you, Life Coach? You've played a lot of the poker in your lifetime as well. Uh, how was your transition from poker to Hearthstone? Was it, was it very simple for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like as Daniel already said, like there are um, definitely like a lot of similarities. So like thinking ahead or strategical decision making. Um, also, I mean, in comparison to StarCraft, there's no APM required. So poker is without APM, like if you don't mass grind and um, Hearthstone, of course, also doesn't uh, require that much uh, attention. Um, so I, I'm actually wondering like how AK will do. I mean, like, um, because like I guess uh, his APM skills, he won't be able to transit <laughs> them at least, right? I did see him playing a little bit of Legacy of the Void the other day. He still got some of that speed, that APM. <laughs> uh, and I guess that won't matter unless he's playing the very old Patron Warrior, which requires you to be very quick sometimes. Right. Yeah, that's where APM actually could come, uh, come <laughs> to help there. You do have to finish your time before the rope burns out, as, yeah. as I'm sure you're quite familiar with. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, uh, um, yeah I remember sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, Love that then, reaction. Then, yeah. That's great, that's great. Well, these guys are going to be playing Best of Five Conquest. Uh, the reason why we you know, talked about lineup in general was because that uh, we do want to say that they're playing a regular match as if they are competing in BlizzCon themselves. Best of Five, win with each deck, and that's why it's really interesting that Elkies bring something like Shaman uh, to the advice of some of his members on Team Liquid. Yeah, it actually, uh, Daniel was saying that, that he was pl originally planning on playing Shaman. Uh, it was a class that he actually played quite a bit. And uh, it was actually after an exchange between, I believe it was uh, myself, Nimsh, and him on Twitter, he decided against it. Uh, Mostly because he didn't understand that Kappa meant sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> he had mentioned, oh, I'm, I'm going to bring, you know, Shaman. He was like, well, I don't know if you should bring that. It's a uh, deck right. that Alki might be prepared for. We'll see. I mean, it's already kind of an interesting Shaman. Game number one's about to drop here. Elgi versus Dan Negrano. The clash between two poker players, and we see Shaman already with some interesting cards. Yeah. The uh, Argent Squire was a mainstay of a lot of Shaman decks. Um, back before the introduction of, of uh, Goblin versus Gnomes, when the, you know, the sort of mech shaman became the really uh, go-to sort of aggressive style, or uh, the introduction of Zombie Chow back at Naxxramas. It, it, it works very well with the buffs like uh, Flame Tongue Totem or Goblin, uh, not Goblin, <laughs> Rock Better Weapon. Yeah, that's where I was going. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I knew exactly what you meant, Kibler. I mean, because speaking of the flame from Totem, I mean, uh, Eki got the perfect curve here from one to four within four cards, so that's the best you can have. And if he only rolls like a flame tongue totem out of the Tusker, then like it's going, re it will go like really well. Like, otherwise, it doesn't uh, uh, still have like the defender for the egg, right? Yeah. Yep, that's right. Uh, the positioning will be important too. You want to slide the Tuscar, you know, between unions or minions that you want to have that adjacent buffs. 
Uh, for now, though, the Hunter's plan is very similar. In fact, the Hunter hero power, as uh, famously said by Killer Again. multiple times, is the, uh, one of the natural enemies against Shaman, which traditionally struggles to heal a lot. So if the game gets out of control and, and Daniel's piling up a lot of pressure with Hunter, then it doesn't even matter what Shaman does on board, it just kills. So we do see Elki pick up that blood. Oh, oh wow. that is the <laughs> that is the dream scenario with Tuskar Totemic getting a free 3-4 totem golem that uh, really allows him to stabilize his board position. Could be a goal have needed that before. Get in there! Yeah, all, <laughs> the searing totems that he got every time, not quite as good. All right, well, uh, I mean, this is one of those cases where can you even bother fighting back on board or it's going to be more aggressive? Looks like Daniel embraces the spirit of Rexar and yeah. goes straight to the face. Uh, but Elki, he has that Defender of Argus that's going to put him in an excellent position against Daniel's board. The Defender is so big here. You're going to force um, the Hunter to go through some high health minions, which spawn even bigger ones with the Nerubian after the Nerubian egg. Then you can pick up some pretty good trades as well. Uh, making sure that you also can go on the offensive against Hunter. Yeah, th there's some interesting decision making here with the defender where exactly you want to choose it because if you do buff the egg here, it, it obviously allows you to potentially make it a Rubian, but it also makes your board significantly weaker to silence because it's a much, a much stronger play against that specific minion. True. True. However, it does force your opponent to go through the Rubian deck, which is what you want. Yeah, Otherwise, you're going to be reliant on the Rockbiter weapon to pop it. Or Bloodlust. Or Bloodlust. So Bloodlust is generally going straight to the opponent's face. That's the plan. I mean, just having five minions on board is half their life. All right, so Elki trades the Divine Shield in and just starts going pretty aggressive because he has that Bloodlust. Yeah, I mean, it's simply lethal next turn, right? So... It, it is it, if Daniel doesn't stop it. I mean, his Animal Companion is a Misha, which... That's not good enough. Some. No, this is this is not going to be good enough. That that bloodlust will punch through a lot of damage. <laughs> uh oh, especially if he's going to load up with more power on the board. I don't even think Daniel's expecting bloodlust oh, no. though. No one how, really expects bloodlust. How common is this on ladder these days? Uh, not common at all. You 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 rarely see bloodlust. Though I imagine there may have been a few more bloodlust casts in the past few weeks after Pimping Ho made his way here. But this is going to do it. Elki comes through. We see a smile on both the players' face as a huge chunk of damage closes out game one. Ooh, full damage, Max and BM. Elki starting off really strong with an unexpected win. Shaman over the Hunter. Not something that you are expecting to see these days. Yeah, not at all. Uh, Shaman is, is usually a class that tends to tends to struggle quite a bit, but that Defender of Argus and the, the Totem Golem coming off the T Tuskar Totemic were huge, huge board presence for him in that game. That's right. Uh, that is uh, Elki's significant other cheering him on in a Jaina costume. Uh, that's just Jaina? I thought that was Jaina. She Jana. looks just like Jaina. Yeah, so it's just like Jaina. Uh, and that's a really good sounding board, at least uh, to cheer for you in the background <laughs> there next to Hamilton Chu. Uh, to anybody tuning in, you're in the middle of watching the Daniel Negrano versus Elki show match. Uh, we're halfway through our quarterfinals, uh, after which we'll be playing Challenge Stone matches featuring me, Kibler, and a few other people. Uh, this is while we get ready for the second half of the quarterfinals, which will be happening later today. Yeah, we, we have uh, two players who have moved through to the semifinals already. Uh, your teammate, Tice, as well as Oskaka. Uh, excellent European representation so far. That's really cool. I mean, a little bit unfortunate that all the Europeans got, like, uh, stuffed in the top eight uh, of the rooster. So they now have to, like, um, yeah, fight each other. But what can you do about it, right? I mean, we are happy enough that two of the Europeans made it to the semifinals and now have the chance to, like, at, um, that at least one European will actually represent Europe in the finals, so that's actually pretty awesome. Yeah, that's right. Last year, no European got to the semifinals. They all got stopped in the top eight. Um, most notably, Kalento dropped in the top eight there. People expect him to go really far. Well, in game number two, we're going to see Mage versus Mage. They're Although, very different mage decks from looking at these opening It could games. be very different outcomes with how it pans out here. So as we saw in the uh, in the opening, uh, Daniel said he, he has gotten his golden mage portrait. And uh, he did so primarily, I believe, through playing a tempo mage style of deck. So this is likely the deck with which he is the most comfortable. All right, well, let's listen in on uh, what they're saying. I hear there's some banter back and forth.
Wanted, dead or alive. There you go. My gift to you. Nothing good? No? That's good. So after that riveting back and forth diatribe between these two players, okay, it's like uh, the here. intensity is back up. I mean, there's a lot of tension inside of that room. Can you feel it? Elkie's with deep breaths. I thought he was the one who was the most calm and collected. Yeah, he was uh, definitely perhaps feeling the pressure here. He, he, he is up one game in this match so far, but uh, this is definitely where Daniel is in his comfort zone. And this explosive sheep is Ooh. the best possible response to Good that air SC. Allows him to not only deal with the secret, but also wipe Daniel's entire board. That's right. And as the mage in Daniel's shoes, you want to be as aggressive as you can onto the board. So losing every Anything like that was really painful. Absolutely. And uh, Gormok the Impaler doesn't have friends to trigger his battle cry, but does come down as a cheap four power minion here, which uh, gives Daniel uh, a bit of a reload on the board. Yeah, uh, you know, Gormok kind of come in like a, like, a, like a Costco package. You need to have a bundle of minions <laughs> in order for Gormok to get some value. Uh, at, at stock price, it's not very powerful. It's just a 4 4 for 4. Well, this is p perhaps an opportunity for Daniel to use the explosive shot he picked up, though he could also use flame cannon ping. Mm -hmm. I would imagine we may see the explosive shot because it's a little bit more efficient overall. But nope, goes the flame cannon, able to take down the Belcher, but Elk, I believe, has a duplicate hiding. Which that's will give be... him full hand, too, by the way, but that's, that's still okay. You have so many good cards in your hand that I think you don't mind what you burn next Show unless it's all. Alex Strasler. Daniel oh, did man. want Elky to dress up like a sludge belcher, so he wants him to have a bunch of sludge oh, belchers. So he knows oh, exactly oh, what he's doing. The Morgan just got burned. Uh, that's big, yeah. That's super huge. Yeah, the element of surprise is gone, too, by the way. So now he knows, like, oh, wait, it's not like Freeze Mage or anything really weird. It's, it's, the sludge belcher already set, like, a couple of alarms off, but... You start seeing that Molten Giant, you know exactly what you're facing. Yeah. So, so Daniel now, he, he's aware that he, he needs to be careful with how he manages Elky's life total. If there is another Molten Giant waiting in his hand, perhaps Echo of Medivh is a card he, he starts thinking about as a possibility. But uh, that explosive shot will clear out the uh, second Sludge Belcher, and then we actually see some big damage coming in from Daniel here, getting Elky yeah. down to just 14 with two Fireballs in hand. If Elky plays like Flame Strike or something, he dies immediately, right? Yeah, he, he needs to both defend himself against the minions and do something to prepare to defend his life total as well because he's so low. Yeah, that's right. It's a really good point that if he flame strikes and clears the board, if something with two attack or more falls out, he not dies. Yeah. yeah, which is very not common to, to see. Um, not to mention that even if he does survive, what if he gets to the point where his opponent can simply weather him down through damage and then kill him with hero powers over turns? There's no heal in Elki's hand right now. I mean, Elki's really looking to find something. Oh, here it is. This yeah. might just oh, oh, be there. Yeah, yeah, two yeah. attack minion. That's perfect. And just enough damage for Daniel to end this game. Uh, <laughs> you see him point, you know, aim and, uh, aim and click there against Elki. And there comes fireball number one, fireball number two. And that's 14 damage going to tie up the, the series one game to one. Yeah, that's right. So Dan Negrano with the fist pump, putting himself <laughs> on the board. Looks this like, was probably uh, like the fastest Echo Giant mage yeah. game I ever saw. Like, yeah. without Echo Giant, right? I mean, so. Well, he did have one Molten Giant possibly drawn, but um, there's two things to this. First, Daniel gets an important win to tie up the series. Uh, the second is that he knows what kind of mage deck this is going for, so the surprise element is also out of the way. Yeah, that's often one of the one of the powerful elements of the deck like Echo Giants is can play like a different style of deck and then sort of spring the trap on you of, oh, yes. okay, here come the Molten Giants. Yeah, so this, that's no longer available at Elki's disposal, but maybe matchup-wise, he's still in a pretty decent spot. Or so you think, until you look at the classes remaining from Daniel, which is Druid and Hunter. And those are two classes which can be very tricky for the Echo Mage to, to engage with. Yeah, exactly what you said. I mean, I mean, I don't know exactly about the matchup against the Hunter, but against Druid, it's horrible. Like, it's really bad. Like, yeah. if, if like, the Druid player executes his... Um, 
and they play a game play correctly, then Ekomet shouldn't have like a chance in that match. So it's really important like for Eki that he chooses his Echo Mage into the Hunter, if possible. So how do you feel uh, after watching one game apiece uh, from both these guys here? What, what, what's your reading? Are, are they playing to your satisfaction, Life Coach? Yeah, well, so uh, Daniel brought like face hunter in the first <laughs> game, right? So that was yeah. actually, I mean, he went face, so that was probably <laughs> already quite well executed. Yeah. Probably right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and Life Coach was like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what we normally come to expect from those hunter decks, really aggressive stuff. Uh, so looks like Daniel at least gets the sense of uh, what, what Rexar is meant to do. I mean, Daniel did pick up a win with his mage deck, and that is the deck that, with which he is the most experienced. True. He, he does have his golden mage portrait, so uh, we'll see how well he navigates the games of the other class as well. Okay, well, this is another important win for Elki to get with his mage deck. If it can withstand the hunter pressure, it can dodge the druid, oh, no. and the winner of this will be at a very big advantage for the remainder of the series, because then they'll be one game away from closing it out. Mm -hmm. And the, the Molten Giant in Elki's hand is a, a very strong one against an aggressive deck. He, he's very likely to get his, his health reduced quite low uh, by the Hunter, so he's able did, to get did, his discount giant. Did Daniel just not point out... Did he really not point out the Knife Juggler? Looks like he chose not to. It looks like he's saving the coin because he for rather better use it for something. But in this case, when he had two jugglers in hand, you'd want to put as much pressure as you want, ideally, correct? It looks like he may be going to coin out the... The Arch Horse Rider. Don't worry, love. So he, he, it looks like he, he wants to play the minion that has the Divine Shield, which gives it a little bit more resilience against possible removal. Uh, though it does it does force him to use his mana somewhat inefficiently over the next couple of turns. Ooh. Okay, well, uh, let's listen in again and see if these guys are exchanging any words for game number three. Let's throw a knife juggler your way, my friend. Here you go. Put this apple on your head. Get in there and fight, maggot! Boom, boom. Okay. I know you got that sheep thing. You can play that sheep thing? What is that sheep thing called? I know what you're thinking. Hmm. I will hunt you down. <laughs> I love that you can do that. <laughs> Threaten. Heavy breathing. That's good for me. What to do? What to do? One person's talking, at least. <laughs> Looks like Daniel Grano is in the zone. Yeah, making little... reads on Elki. That, that, that sheep yeah. thing, unfortunately, for Elki, not in his hand, but... Uh... Right. Well, I mean, I mean, it's one of those things where he's like, yeah, play it, I know you have it. He doesn't yeah. have it, because obviously he <laughs> would try playing it to reduce the pressure. I mean, so Daniel's gathering some information, trying to use some of those old man tricks here. Yeah, Daniel in a you know, pretty good spot here with a, a lot of aggression, though Elki does have that ice block down, as well as Molten Giant. So uh, he could be in a spot where he gets to start playing gigantic minions, but he doesn't have any heal. So if, if his ice block is popped, oh, there's oh, that cheap thing. Nice draw for Elki there. We see a little bit of dance on Daniel's side. Yeah, he won't be dancing for really long, though, if the explosive sheep clears the board. Um, well, it won't clear it entirely because of the Divine Shield. Yeah. The Argent Force Rider does survive. No damage from the Divine Shield preventing it. Uh, Elki down to 15. Huh. Well, uh, heal it will get pretty close, actually. Like, I mean, he cannot, like, proc the block this turn, but if he can actually proc the block next turn, I mean, he doesn't die within the next three turns, does he? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Elki would have to um, drop three or four giants worth in order to kill him. And in order to do that, he has to make sure his ice pocket is not popped either on the following turn. So Elki can potentially this turn play Molten Giant, Sun Fury, ooh, or the Sludge Belcher, but he can play Molten Giant, Sun Fury, and Echo, which allowed him to play another Giant, but he'd only have the one Taunt still. And still, no, no way to gain life in Elki's hand, so even if he does get a, a good uh, board full of Taunt minions, uh, it's unlikely he can survive do, if Elki's able to block, pop his block. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Elki has to top deck. Like, if he doesn't top deck, then it's over, basically. 
and it, but the thing is, he's, he's limited with what he can draw, too, because Alex Strauss would be too expensive the right. following turn. Yeah, he, right. So he would need to get the heal bot or a second ice block to stay alive. Mm -hmm. What's also really do. interesting is that, I mean, Aki can actually produce four taunted molten giants, but he cannot save himself. Yeah, so that's... I mean, it's not about the board here, but... All right, so Elki chooses to go for the most taunts possible, but that doesn't matter because Daniel can still burn through it. <laughs> Trying to wave over to nervously pass the turn, but Daniel is determined to pop the ice block this turn. And we do see both copies of Kill Command in Daniel's hand. He can fire one off at Elki's face, use his hero power, pop the ice block at two, and Elki's going to need to find some form of heal in, or heal in order to survive, despite having an army of Volt Giants with taunt. He could also potentially find uh, a second copy of Ice Block that could buy him enough time because he's actually going to be able to attack for 18 damage this turn. Yeah, that's primarily it. And even if he got like Scientist, for example, that wouldn't be enough. Lotheb! Ooh, that's an interesting one. Lotheb not able to do it though. He no, still because needs to heal. Even just the hero power kills him. <laughs> yeah, the hero power goes past every single taunt here. If and Elki's he... caught in a classic struggle against uh, <laughs> hero power versus what else he can do. <laughs> if you were if you were just at three life, he would actually potentially be able to win this game with that low theft, but <laughs> he is he is just one too few life and he's <laughs> gonna put out a absolute Shield. army of giants, but yeah. they cannot stop steady shot. He's uh, well. He's gonna really hope for some user error on Daniel's side. Think like maybe he'll forget the hero power. But I don't think that's the case. No, at all. and Elki concedes. Daniel Negreanu is gonna go up to a two-one <laughs> lead over Elki. And he's that's bad, uh, that, that's definitely really good for Daniel. You know, he never hit legend. He's only hit rank five due to I guess time constraints and plus uh, you know newness to the game. But Elki, he's hit legend multiple times. So he comes in here as a player trying to defend his honor, making sure that he can live up to his reputation. Yeah. And uh, he, he did have uh, you know, a, a deck there that struggled quite a bit with what Daniel, uh, Daniel was playing there. He, he needed to find uh, you know, something more to actually regain his life there. Uh, perhaps if he had found a heal bot, things might have been a little bit different. But uh, as it stands, Daniel is one game away from winning this exhibition match. Yeah, I think um, it's really dangerous again because this Druid still remains. And so the Druid goes up against the Mage. Uh, that'll be really tricky. And we don't even know what Warlock it is either. Um, if he chose Handlock, then he's in really big trouble because oh, the yeah. Druid will put a lot of pressure on both these classes. I hope it's Dreadsteed. Uh, Dreadsteed Warlock, that's <laughs> pretty awesome. I, have you got a chance to play Dreadsteed Warlock at all, Life Coach? Which one? Uh, the Dreads, a Dreadsteed type ah, Warlock. Ah, the Dreadsteed. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, actually, like, I think it's so bad that I didn't even try it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, how do you know it's bad if you haven't even tried it? Because you played against it a couple times. No, I mean, there are decks and decks, so some decks they are with weird cards, and sometimes it could be a thing, so perhaps you have to try it first. Sure, For example, sure. with this stuff which gives you, like, 10 mana. What is it? Astral Communion. Astral communion. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the com uh, Communion. Yeah, I, I tested that, and, like, after five games, I found this not being, like, anywhere mm -hmm. good. Um, but, like, stuff like Dreadsteed, I don't think you need to waste your time to test <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> all right, well, uh, words, harsh words from Life Coach to all the Dreadsteed fan players there, but don't worry, his time will come. In the meantime, game number four is about to begin. One more time, we'll try and see if Elki's mage can turn around, but if he drops to the Druid, that is it. Ooh, Daniel with some interesting, uh, interesting cards in his opening hand, Kel'Thuzad, a uh, you know, powerful <laughs> late game, uh, late game threat, but not necessarily what you're looking for here. Here, I think Daniel's looking to pressure Elki as quickly as possible. It's not just any Kel'Thuzad; it's golden Kel'Thuzad. Oh, yeah. oh. So you had to craft it manually from the adventure set. Do you think this is perhaps the reason why we see him in the deck? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, He's so shiny. Golden. It is, it is pretty amazing if you have it um, synergized with some taunt minions that just keep coming back, like Sludge Belcher, for example. Each. Speaking of taunt minions, it's yep. a, a giant hand of taunts from Daniel. He chooses to innervate out of that Sludge Belcher. Though he does have pretty much nothing but uh, expensive minions left in his hand. Going to give Elki quite a bit of time. Yeah, Elki would love the amount of time that he could have. Um, Echo Mage is one of the best at winning long games of attrition. And the reason why we were saying Druid was a big threat to this type of mage deck was because uh, the normal Druid, which is very fast, that has two versions of Force Nature Savage War, they're always threatening to potentially just pop your Ice Block, and you don't have the way to catch up uh, against on the board the way you would like to before you die. Mm. Well, actually, it's like already enough if you only place one combo because like.
the, the Echo Mage doesn't have any tools without the Giants to ever outvalue the Druid, which means like if the Druid simply let the Mage stay at 21 life, mm -hmm. he can never drop anything, which is basically also the key to this matchup. I mean, I don't know whether Daniel knows, but it's like if you simply let the Mage what above 21, do. it's unlosable. Sure, that's also a good point, because then Molten Giants and Duplicates and all those Echoes don't actually happen on the Molten Giants themselves. Daniel Daniel has seen Elki play this deck twice now, so he is certainly aware, at least, of the presence of Molten Giant in the deck. So I, uh, we'll, we'll see if he does make the sort of play adjustments in order to play around that possibility. All right, well, the Doomsayer to preemptively uh, address the board, both on this turn and the next one for Druid. And he does pick up Keep with the Grove. Is this a time where he can afford to let that slide, or do you think it's more important that he preserves his board right now? It's kind of an interesting spot. Uh, he, he does have just a fairly weak board. It could save this for a future Doomsayer, could potentially save this for uh, a Taunted Giant, for instance. Uh, but he does choose to silence the Doomsayer and uh, ensure that the end is not, in fact, coming. No, and that's... That's really good because the Druid needs to keep this momentum. Even if it doesn't have the Force of Nature Savage War, you can threaten it against your opponent to make them really scared. One interesting thing uh, about silencing a Doomsayer in this matchup, because Elki is playing with Echo of Medivh, he can possibly just reload a second Doomsayer off of a copy of Echo of Medivh, True uh, despite the, uh, the minion in play uh, not actually having any abilities. That is true. And it's not like you can kill off a Doomsayer anytime soon, right? Yeah. I mean, it would cost Daniel uh, seven damage in order to do that, but he decides to just send six damage to Elki's face. He's not afraid. No, not at all. Because he does have the big game hunter, so maybe he can, feels like he can deal with one of the giants. So this is Elki in an interesting position here. He's facing down quite a powerful board without really all that many strong plays of his own this turn. Yeah, that's right. This is, um, I mean, it's, it feels like it's okay if he plays slightly defensively. He still has to figure out ways that you would win, because one of the drawbacks of playing Heelbot, for example, is if you're that much farther away from Molten Giants, mm -hmm. which you do want to inevitably be a threat. And he also coins and hero powers, so that way, in case his opponent dealt with the board already, with swipe and hero power, for example, he could flame strike the next uh, set of minions down. He does have that flame strike waiting, uh, but Daniel has a, a variety of minions that he can choose to play, uh, none of which are particularly vulnerable to that flame strike. No, Ancient of War is one of the most resilient uh, minions in the game against flame strike. <laughs> he is quite large. Ancient of War uproot? No, I'm disappointed. <laughs> it would survive a flame strike. It would. It would. Back over to Team Elki here. Uh, I mean, has this developed enough where maybe he can start swinging back the game, or do you think Druid still has too much initiative life, Coach? Mm. I mean, it's an interesting point, right? I mean, the Druid is also a little bit like with Keltuzat, things are changing. So, um, what is with the Polymorph? Do you think he will Polymorph the 510 Taunt? Mm. I mean, it's it's juicy, right, to do that. But it if is. he does it, then if he cannot also handle Keltuzat, he will probably pose quite a threat. Mm. That's right. He'll never be able to get to kill the Zod because the Sludge Belcher will keep spawning slimes and uh, not to mention it will keep coming back. So Elki it, it has a lot that he has to deal with right now, and the threat of Kel'Thuzad looming in Daniel's hands certainly does not make it easier. Elki doesn't know that he's oh. going to have to deal with that, and uses his Polymorph to take down the Ancient of, uh, Ancient of War. As, uh, as Life Coach said, a very juicy target. Daniel uh, applauding. <laughs> I believe he's applauding uh, himself for forcing his <laughs> opponent to play exactly the way he wanted to. He's like, yes, you polymorph that and, and not something else. Like my Kale Dazad coming down, Elki can't deal with it. And that is going to be problematic to say the least. And yeah, Elki now needs to, ooh, he does like Frost Nova, but no Doomsayer. Elki is like, not like this, please. Not like this. <laughs> Well, let's actually hear if Helki has anything to say. He's been relatively quiet. Maybe he has got a few words for Daniel. <laughs> oh, so sick. Mm. Yeah. So far, I like the way things are going right now. I'll show them. I'll show them all. But Elki always has tricky plans. Hey! Not very nice. Do 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 do
Alternative into Frost Nova and Doomsayer. Like decisions, everything. And decisions. as we see, like, there wouldn't have been a handle. But okay, this is because we see the hand, but I think press in those situations you have simply to hope for the best. Oh, we see a 5 2. Uh, uh, what is it? What is it called? That's Fire? a, that is a Druid Fire. of Flame. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's like a lion. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a card that we saw uh, before. Um, as it looks like it's, it's a card that used to be used as a 2 5 minion to try to handle some aggro, but he's using it here very aggressively as a 5 2. Yeah. It looks like that it would have charged, but it simply doesn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it does a lot of damage to my face, which I don't like. It's Oops. also a uh, stat for stat equivalent to an Ice Rager. It is. It yes. is the... Uh, what is it, by the way, already nearly over? It, yeah, well, it, I mean... It's going to be tough for Elkie to come back here. I don't... He has that second Doomsayer that he just found, but no way to freeze Daniel's board right now. Well, I think it's simply over, right? Right, I mean, because um, there's... It's not Ice Block, and any minion that he kills actually comes back because of Kill the Zod. Because, like, he can't actually deal with this legendary minion which keeps spawning other ones. He didn't oh, yeah, find a secret, the so this, this ah, barrel right. could be Ice Block here, okay. so... Uh, may not quite be over for Elkie, but he's definitely on the ropes. Yeah, I mean, Daniel will have to make sure that uh, he makes the right play, but even if he played it really safe, it's still the question wondering, like, can Elkie deal with this kill this odd? So we do see uh, Duplicate giving a couple more copies of Doomsayer to Elkie, but he does not look like he is likely to have the time to use them. Now let's pick up another Frost Nova, in which case that would potentially flip this game upside down with the Echo and Frost Nova Molten combinations. If he is able to find something like Frost Nova, perhaps a Blizzard, uh, some way really to just keep uh, keep Daniel's minions at bay. It would have been nice like to uh, sacrifice the Sludge Badger, perhaps, because like if you sacrifice the Sludge Badger, you would have got the exact same copy and another minion. So yeah. There's oh, Frost ooh. Nova. Oh, Elki finding exactly what he needs. He can actually play the Molten Giant, Echo, Nova, Doomsayer. Or rather, Molten Giant, Doomsayer, Nova, Echo. <laughs> you could if you really feel like um, you just want to cash in onto the board and really get as many cards as possible. The one thing that I was counting was making sure that he didn't uh, overdraw. Oh, it looks like he might do just that. Well, this, this does make it so that, that if Daniel has a silence effect, that it's more likely he's able to actually... Uh, actually ensure that the board does get wiped. Mm -hmm. Well, he's going to echo this board, and that's, that's a lot of Doomsayers if he's going to commit to this. I think he wants... If he, if, oh, he actually can't echo and Nova. He actually is out of... Uh, he doesn't have quite enough mana. Oh, yeah, you're right. That was probably a consideration as well. He's so going to drop one more Doomsayer just to see if he can permanently wipe this board off the face of the planet. And the way the Doomsayers trigger is that the slimes will be remaining after they die anyways. Uh, does he overdraw, by the way? If he doesn't drop the Doomsday? I, I think believe he has 10 right? cards in his hand. Mm. Uh, I believe you are correct as well. I'm counting, there should be 10 cards. So I, be I believe Daniel actually has the damage to remove both of these Doomsayers and break the Ice Block fairly easily. Uh, that's right, and that's, that's really big because then you still have the option of um, keeping your board and you're not worried about your opponent like Alex draws and you back up. So Elkie's Ice Block is broken. Uh-oh. Well, I mean, I think Daniel is on the verge of securing his victory. The only thing is he doesn't have direct damage from the hand. The but I don't side. know if he necessarily needs it, because uh, outside of this one Frost Nova, how do you stall another turn against this kind of board? I mean, he does have the Frost Nova. He could Frost Nova potentially with the Doomsayer this turn. Uh, potentially even play... And it, ooh, with, with Daniel playing the Ancient of Lore, he actually can't play... Uh, a potential Keeper of the Grove or something to silence a Doomsayer. Oh, uh, burns Molten Giant. That's, that's got to hurt for Elk here. He knows that this Molten Giant in his hand is the last one he will have besides it, when's it might get echoed or duplicated. But he's able to get this Doomsayer down, and I think Kel'Thuzad may finally die next turn. <laughs> I mean, or, I mean, uh, Daniel could just draw four damage from the from the hand in a swipe and end this game, but he drops does the end up dropping so. the heal bot. Keep himself out of right. You see, we see Daniel laughing. He's like, oh, I can't even do anything. That's right. Although the, the problem still remains is he can't necessarily kill uh, KT just yet. Well, Kel'Thuzad will die to the Doomsday. Oh, you're correct. I'm sorry about it. I just completely forgot about the Doomsday being played on board. So everything, uh, everything dies except for these two slimes. 
And now, suddenly the game is uh, is back to being a bit less one-sided. Elki potentially able to drop this giant, maybe uh, maybe pair it with Duplicate to give him, uh, or, or even the Echo, to, to give him some additional possible threats. Yeah, with the ability to at least uh, echo one of the giants, he still has a lot of firepower because Daniel used one of his big game hunters. Uh, I'm not sure if he runs two. Yeah, Daniel's Daniel's deck a little hard to hard to guess what we might see next. He's uh, he's playing a very taunt heavy defensive druid deck, uh, not really akin to the ones that most of the players are playing in the World Championship. Oh, he doesn't look very by the way, happy. Already, like there are no secrets in the deck left, or what do you think? Like because of the mad scientist, like. Um, like, all secrets have been drawn already out, oh, so... I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what Elki's hand is consisting out of. It's like one Molten, one Alex, mm -hmm. but uh, if um, Daniel simply handles those threats, which he can probably do, uh, especially with his high damage composition, or with his high curve Druid, then Elki would simply run out of cards, right? It's entirely possible. It's true. It is interesting that Elki also chose to play Alex Straza without playing his own Molten beforehand. Yeah, he had the opportunity to play the Molten for one mana and then Alex Straza himself. I think if he wants to surprise his opponent, then it definitely will be off of Daniel's mind because that was an opportunity to play the Molten. The Molten Giant was actually from Echo of Medivh. So right. I, I believe that, that Daniel should have full knowledge of the fact that it is in Elki's hand. Okay, well... I, th I think the plan is like that Aki realizes that his deck doesn't have enough value to be Druid at all, so he takes the gamble and tries to echo off Medivh the Molten Giant later, in combination with other cards. But, um, I mean, once, like, he could, of course, perhaps, like, echo the Doomsayer, but that's of no value, or the Mad Scientist, but he's also of no value. I mean, I mean we talked about that, right? right. So Flame Strike clears Daniel's board, gives uh, a little bit of a respite to Elki with the Zombie Chow Death Rattle, bringing him back up to 18 life. He did have to play that Molten Giant first, mm -hmm. uh, or else the, the cost of the Molten Giant would have been increased as his life went up. Well, now Daniel has an opportunity to remove the Alex Alexstrasza pretty easy with that cheap Wrath. Yeah, and it's zero where, like, uh, Eki cannot do anything against it, right? Or does he? I don't think he has a handle. So, is there will at least take two turns on the board, which is really, really huge. Yeah. And another thing, too, is that Elki used both of his uh, Moltens up, uh, which means that he's running a little bit no low on the threat games. side outside of this Emperor, and maybe he has, like, a Sylvanas in his deck as well. So this Sylvanas also really threatening against the Molten Giant. If, uh, if Daniel is able to steal Molten Giant, it will make uh, life quite difficult for Elki. And it's also just a threat that he needs to try and deal with as well. Well, Healbot uh, draws for Elki just makes him further away from the combination of Force Nature Savage War, if that's exactly what Daniel is holding. So at least Elki has that as a, as a sanctity of mine. Uh, say, looking at here, though, he can maybe try to set up that the Giant will get as much value as possible, setting up for an Echo, perhaps. But is he afraid of dying to, you know, his opponent's burst pop potential, which he might even question now that he's seen Kale the Zod and Ancient of Wars and Sengen Shield Master. Yeah, it's also funny with the Thorison because, like, because of the Sylvanas, um, Eki can actually not play mm. Thorison and Echo of Medivh. So it basically blocks in his turn, too, which is quite huge. He could potentially play uh, perhaps Healbot, maybe Doomsayer, and then s attack into the Sylvanas, give him a couple of uh, things that are fairly weak. But no, he's just going to give him the giant and then shoot it down with his own BG. Okay. And then play Emperor Thoris and try to use whatever he has. Oh, he's afraid of dying potentially to a Force Nature Savage War, so he instead he goes for the Healbot. Okay. Izira still um, would stay two turns, so. Yeah, Ysera is still very problematic because um, Elki already used one of his polymorphs and Daniel would I have Ysera just gathering cards. Friends. Looks like Daniel is uh, debating if he wants to attack one of the minions. He wants to perhaps play the zombie Chow into this board. He does have two mana left over thanks to the cost reduction on that Ysera. Yeah, I'm also wondering like what, what uh, yeah, I mean the zombie Chow has to come down at some point. Right? Um, we saw him staying uh, in the hand for the pre yeah, for the last few turns. But I guess on the board, it's, he's simply stronger than in the hand. Yeah, and then Ysera picks up Dream. Not really the strongest thing for Daniel here, though it can potentially allow him to answer uh, some large minion without having to sacrifice any of his board for at least a turn. Yeah, but this is a really powerful Ooh. echo yeah. uh, of Medivh, because you're going to reduce all of those 
cards cost uh, by one from the Emperor Thorson itself. So there is still a secret in Elky's deck, perhaps the second copy of Ice Block. Yes, most likely there. And he is going to go up to 30 health, and Druid, without the Force of Nature Savage Roar, is going to be struggling to put the final points of damage on. So, you know, even though he does have Ysera on the board, does Daniel have enough to close this game out? I think AQ will simply run out of cards eventually. As we saw, like, the duplicated cards were all, like, of not big value. Big Game Hunter, I mean, there's big in the name, but he's not, not <laughs> big value in this match. The same goes for the Healboard and for the Mad Sign. Yeah, this Ysera is going to continue providing Daniel with resources that uh, will give him additional, uh, additional value as the game progresses. So, uh, LT really needs to deal with it fairly quickly. I don't think he can, though. Again, there's no real direct removal for the Ysera, and he has to generate six more damage uh, from the hand to just kill it. Right. And a lot of times, these decks, these Echo Mages, might not even run Fireballs or other ways to directly remove it just damage-wise. And we have seen him already play a copy of Polymorph, so uh, yes. if he has a second one, that's really what he's looking for here. Uh, he could try and hide a Doomsayer behind a Sludge Belcher. Uh, though we know that Daniel has that copy of Dream in his hand, which uh, could make any mm. taunt uh, really unreliable. Yeah, and then he had this dancing game of like, well, the board tension keeps building, but Doomsayer never gets to trigger, and therefore he might even answer it the moment you can secure it. Elke going to play a duplicate to hopefully force his opponent to attack into the Sludge Belcher and duplicate it, but then if Daniel sees that opportunity, he might Dream and force a copy on something like a Mad Scientist. And, you know, mad science is being duplicated is not what you want to say. Not at all. Especially when you've, you're, you're so far into your deck that you've likely played oh, all of your secrets. Yeah, I mean, the dream here is, of course, very strong now. I mean, especially if you can use it against Belchers. I mean, Ezera is simply drawing one every, like, uh, drawing one big Ezera dream cut every turn. It's just so, yeah, it's just amazing if you have her on the board. Yeah, the shade continues to grow as well. Innervate, not what Daniel is looking for, but... That's probably the, the, the most useless card <laughs> draw you can have on top of his deck. But he sees the dream, and that's not going to make Elke happy at all. Whatever Daniel kills next will duplicate, whether Big Game Hunter or Mad Scientist. It looks like he may be attacking into the Big Game Hunter first does give Elki two more copies of Big Game Hunter. Not much big game in his deck, however, so uh, not <laughs> yeah. much for him to do. Unless he uproots this. Uh, there's nothing really <laughs> to see it. I don't care that you just duplicated Big Game Hunters. I want it uprooted. That would be uh, for, for the ultimate BM. <laughs> I would love that. Elki, by the way, in danger of just dying next turn. Uh, not only does Daniel have the potential lethal with whatever he draws, but he has that nightmare as additional bonus damage. Yeah. And the cheap thing that Daniel was talking about in a previous game uh, off the top of the deck for Elki, not really so yeah. effective against a board full of large minions. Not at all. Elki needed some Frost Novas, something to stall. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, does, he, he will be staying alive essentially by playing another antique heal bot in a Sludge Belcher. He can stay alive, but he, he's not really making any headway toward actually being in a winning position in this game. True. Uh, Daniel did pick up an Emerald Drake off of Ysera last turn, which not match up well against those two big game hunters, but yeah. it's, th it's not looking like he's going to need too many more dream cards to close this one out. Yeah, he might just need raw damage and, um, and, a, and a target for Nightmares to be received, and then he can just end the game right there. I believe Elki does have the, uh, the Ice Block most likely as his remaining secret, so if, if Daniel does sort of go all in with Nightmare here, it could end poorly for him. But uh, even then, even then, I, I feel like he's uh, going to have some large threats left over. Wild Growth, that's going to that's gonna find him a new one. That's right. Wild Growth will draw him an additional card, even though there are there's already maxed out of Mana Crystals. That's the way you can use it late game. And he picks up Silence. Drew the Claw is helpful to help him clear the Doomsayer efficiently. So he doesn't have to use uh, too many resources. But I guess he, he could still do that and yeah, he, play Emerald Drake and do the cross on taste because he has Interface. Yeah, I mean, he could just use his hero power and the shades to clear the seven health from the Doomsayer. Uh, so the end will not, in fact, be coming. He could also choose to charge the, the Druid of the Claw. But he has, he has the, the Innervate, so he could go to, to the full 10 mana here uh, if he really wanted to. Not really anything to do with all of that, though. I mean, we were laughing at the two BGHs when we saw them, but as a matter of fact, um, the one BGH will target the 7-7 seven, seven Shade, and the other BGH will target the Emerald Drake, so they will have their use. Oh, wow. Daniel oh. chooses not to 
not to kill the Doomsayer, just pushes damage to face, cracks the ice block. And it looks like he was hoping that was something else, some other uh, secret, but... So he thought he may have had lethal. Oh, but he may just next turn anyway. Yeah, Ysera awakens his five direct damage to everybody that's not named But Elki has the heal bot. Elki goes back up to nine. You see, oh, roll of his eyes for Daniel. No worries, because I have a feeling Daniel could still just draw lethal off the top. Just needs anything that does three damage. And Guys, it is like, swipe. Oh, swipe. Oh, that is it. Is it. Oh, Sarah awakens five damage clear the board. Swipe to Elki's face, and Daniel Negranu is going to win our show match. Oh, Elki <laughs> is crushed. He says no. You are the one that's supposed to wear a Chan <laughs> cosplay, not me. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Elki's Sludge Belcher costume ends up looking like. That's a, a really difficult one to <laughs> cosplay. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be one for the ages. Congratulations to Daniel Grano. You won our best of five exhibition show match between two poker players. Uh, so, so what do we think? What do we think about uh, their first year essentially competing on the big stage of Hearthstone? I mean, I think they, they, they both played well. I, I thought it was cool that, that they uh, brought some interesting decks. You know, the Echo Mage deck from Elki. You know, very we got to see some cool things happen. Didn't work out for him very well. Well, uh, but it's definitely fun to see. Yeah, definitely. Especially like um, I liked when Daniel like went full face, and then the ice block popped off. I mean, he already saw the ice block. <laughs> there was like a pure surprise, and then like uh, some realization that, that he saw that before. I think. <laughs> so I was like, oh damn. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, some fun moments, uh, some memorable moments, and Rachel is down with Daniel to get a few words to see what was some of his favorite moments during that match. Thank you so much, guys. I am here with Daniel DeGrano and Elki, and oh my, I have seen a lot of Hearthstone matches, but I've never seen someone so sad to lose, and I've never seen someone so excited to win. Daniel, talk to me about this match against Elki. I was so nervous. I play poker for millions and millions of dollars, and I'm cool as a cucumber, but I was like, my blood was flowing. This is like my new passion, right? So, you know, having a chance to win as an underdog, like, he's got more experience, I mean, I didn't, I honestly didn't think I was going to win. I'm just ecstatic that I did. Well, Elki, we definitely saw the stone-faced professional poker player at the table today. What was going on behind the glasses? Uh, it was really hot because actually the Echo Mage deck I played, I didn't play it much before, but I practiced like a lot last few days. And then like there's some situation where I clearly made mistakes and it kind of cost me the game, I think, because like it was like kind of like a surprising deck if you didn't play against it, but it never really turn around that well, and some games are outside, you endorse them, and some other games are misplayed, so it kind of sucked, actually. <laughs> well, that was a tough one. I have to say, Daniel, you really put your heart and soul into it, and as someone who is a golden mage, yes. I find it a little surprising that you didn't know the name of Polymorph. Oh, I knew po Did I say Polymorph wrong? Oh, I just heard the sheep card, the sheep card. Oh, no, the other sheep thing, the one that's like, does deal two damage to everyone. Oh, the explosive sheep. That annoying little sheep, yeah. Yeah, that one. I hate that one. <laughs> well, uh, I hear that you guys had a agreement going into this, and I don't think you're going to be able to get out of it. So, Elki, tell me, what exactly does this mean for you? Well, I'm going to have to play as a sludge belcher at the PCA, so that's going to be pretty hard. <laughs> I guess you can go eat something now to like, uh, ease the pain. <laughs> I cannot wait to see this. Now, I have to know, what do your poker friends think of this Hearthstone passion that you have? Uh, I think they really loved it. Like, the excitement was really, really big in the poker community. So, and actually, I told them to bet on me, so I kind of feel bad now. <laughs> sore, sore advice. But Daniel, you said that this is your new passion. So, uh, do you think next year we might see you on this stage of the Hearthstone World Championship? I know how much dedication it requires to get to the absolute, you know, the world championships. I don't know that I have the time for that, but I'd love to. I'm still learning. I've been playing for six months. Uh, apparently better than this guy, though, right? He's been playing for years, <laughs> right? And, and I'm just happy to, like, most of us in the poker community, he mentioned they were talking about it on Twitter and social media, and they all wanted to bet on that guy. So, so actually, I'm not sorry to disappoint. I'm very happy to. <laughs> Well, congratulations to you both. You put on an impressive show, and I hope you join us once again on a Hearthstone stage in the future. And uh, folks, that's not our only exhibition today. Up next, we have our Challenge Stone show matches, and I'm excited to see which of my fellow broadcasters are going to take the win, especially because they have been arguing about this. I'm not joking, since it was announced. So please stay tuned, we've got more coming up, but now let's take a look at our Windows 10 DVR replay.
2015 World Championship Series